Well, good morning. Good morning. It's a pleasure seeing you all again and, and looking very much forward to your presentation. We're going to first make our judges introductions and then afterwards we'll ask the, the panel to introduce themselves. Um, so my name is Emmanuel Caudillo. I serve as a senior advisor with the White House Hispanic Prosperity Initiative here in Washington, D.C. Good morning. It's good to see you again. I am still Jen Howell with Virginia Civics. And Tom? Tom, Tom seems to be frozen. Yep. Yeah, let's, um, should I do, hold on. And for our, for our panelists, feel free to introduce yourself and your teacher. Hi, my name is Aubrey Tomsick. Hi, my name is Derek Streitenberger. Hi, my name is Aubrey Briseno. And may you introduce your teacher, please? Uh, and our teacher, uh, Mr. Browning. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, thank you so much. Um, uh, Carol, it'd be, it'd, be, it'd be great if you just maybe wait a minute or two for Tom to, to get in. I know we're, we're, we're also in West Virginia. I'm sorry, the squirrels got biting on the uh, cable, excuse me. All right, why don't we go ahead and get started? Okay, no problem, no problem. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go read the, the question and then once I'm uh, completed reading the question, you may begin. No society, certainly not a large and heterogeneous one can fail in time to explode if it is deprived of the arts of compromise. No good society can be unprincipled and no viable society can be principle ridden. Do you agree or disagree with this opinion? What compromises were made at the Constitutional Convention of 1787? What are the benefits and costs of those compromises? How would you distinguish between someone who is unprincipled and someone who is principle ridden? You may begin. No society can be a true functional society without rules or principles to keep it organized. Although there is a fine line between unprincipled and principle ridden. If a society were to be more lenient with its rules, people would feel they have the freedom they should have as individuals that are contributing factors to a society. Though without pillars or foundation, there would be more crime along with fatality and poverty rates drastically increasing. From the 1700s to present day, crime rates have gradually decreased because of more rules that have been put into place. Although, along with more rules comes more protesting against the rules that are said to have been changing our society to principle rate. There has to be a balance between the rules in a society in order for it to be fair to the people and the government. Compromises have to be made and have been made all throughout history. As Alexander Hamilton said, the true principle of government is to give it perfect proportion and balance to its parts. So therefore, we agree with there were many important compromises that have shaped our government today. There are three major ones, such as the Three-Fifths Compromise. This was the agreement of delegates from the Northern and Southern states. Another plan that took place was the Electoral College. This compromise was about the popular election for the president and the Electoral College election for the president. Another agreement is the Great Compromise. This stated that there would be two House legislators in a bicameral Congress. Uh, there are a few other plans, however, that also took place. There's the Commerce Compromise, which focused on import and export taxes, and more importantly, it focused on the slave trade. This leads to the trade of enslaved people, also known as the Slave Trade Compromise. This plan gave Congress the power to ban slave trade, and it made many states free their slaves, starting the movement to end slavery. To go along with all these compromises, there are benefits and costs of them, too. The Three-Fifths Compromise has many pros, such as it allowed pro-slavery states to have a disproportionate influence on the presidency and government, meaning the South benefited because they included three out of every five slaves into their population count, meaning that would give them more seats in the House of Representatives. 
But a cost of the three-fifths compromise, however, is that the North felt that this was unjust because their perspective was that the South it was that the slaves didn't have any natural rights, but really the South just, or really the North just didn't want the South to have control of the government. Another impactful compromise was the Electoral College. Some pros to the Electoral College was that this plan ensures that all parts of the country have a say in choosing the government. But some cons to this compromise is that this plan can contradict the popular vote. The Great Compromise created balance and equality in the government. However, this plan favored the larger states and the smaller states felt that they would be ignored. There are many other impactful comp compromises that have made a huge impact on our government today. You can distinguish between unprincipled and who is principle ridden by how they act. An example of a principle ridden person would be Thomas Jefferson, who had a strict understanding of the Constitution. Jefferson bought the Louisiana Territory, but did not ask Congress, though he knew it would help our nation because it would double its size. Although Jefferson was unconstitutional by buying the land and not consulting with Congress, the purchase did end up helping the U.S. once again, but went against his morals as a principle-ridden person. This is how you know someone is principle-ridden, because they follow the fine print the majority of the time. Someone who is unprincipled and did not have a strict understanding of the Constitution was Alexander Hamilton. He wanted to use the elastic clause for anything he felt necessary to our nation or to his specific political party, which was the Federalists. There's always good to have because if we didn't, it would be a very unorganized country or a very country. Because of the principle written and on principle, you can see how they govern it today. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, thank you so much. Thank you so much for um, your presentation. And so now I believe we will um, begin our question and discussion period here. And so uh, I'll start off with the first question. And actually it comes from the, the, the main quote that we, we, we asked in the, what was said in the beginning of the, of the presentation. Um, compromise is often called an art. Is that an apt description? Why or why not? I say that yes, it is in art because um because an art is something that like people should be like proud of and like um something that's like cool um and very interesting to uh like look at and compromises are very um they're very uh important and i think yes it is considered an art Yeah, and, and and before we move on to the next question, and I'm, I'm interested to see uh, some of the other panelists as well. To which you, if you consider this an art as well, is this something that you? you is it? It's an opinion question. So just want to know if you think this is also an art as well, uh, an art of compromise. Can you repeat that question? It cut out for me. No problem. No problem. So I also wanted to hear. Uh, uh, the, um, I also wanted to hear from, from others as well, whether, whether you consider compromise an art as, as it's also an art. Um, do you think that's an accurate description? Uh, why or why not? I would say that um, compromise is an art because it takes a lot of um, patience and work, um, a lot of hard work to come to a conclusion of a compromise. And that's what, um, uh, these people did um, back to create the Great Compromise, and it was um, it was almost like like art because um, looking back on it, you can just admire what it took to get this compromise of representation. To add on uh, to that, art is also very subjective, and compromises could be that way too because maybe one side of the compromise doesn't get like as much as they thought they were entitled to so they might be mad and so they might subject that one side is greater than the other do you think it's become more difficult for americans to compromise um uh, 
And if so, why do you think it's become more difficult for us to compromise in our political system? Um, I think it has become um, harder to compromise because there's a lot more um, there's a lot more uh, that needs to be um, dealt with, and that's um, I think what my teammate I think what my teammate is trying to say is that. There are a lot of things going on in society today, and a lot of people have different viewpoints. And I think some people just um, that we just need to work on as a society, just coming to a compromise like how they did um, with like the Great Compromise and the Three Fifths Compromise, and just compromises like that. I think we should come together as a society and know how to deal with these issues as a whole. To add on to what my teammate is saying, um, I agree. I have a lot more trouble um, coming to a compromise today just because of how our society has brought up um, how we feel almost like entitled to everything. And it makes it harder to come to a compromise on things that we feel we shouldn't. You mentioned it in your uh, opening remarks, uh, but there's a great debate going on now about whether we should uh, make changes in our electoral, co electoral college or go to a popular vote. Based upon your research, uh, what, do you, what action do you think should be taken and why? I think that we should get rid of the electoral college because the president should be decided on what the people want, not like what a group of uh, people want. And some examples like mayors, senators, house, house of representatives, they are all decided with the popular vote. They don't use the electoral college. So I think we should just get rid of the electoral college. To add on what my teammate was saying, um, I agree that we should get rid of the electoral college because the whole point of our nation is um, that we give people a voice and um, that the citizens have more of a say in the government. Um, and the electoral college essentially gets rid of that because yes, there is a popular vote. But in the end, it all comes down to the electoral college, which is really what My next question, um, actually, I, I read um, from your uh, presentation, I, there's a quote that you again mentioned, um, that if a society has more rules, then it would lead to more protest. And so I found that very, very interesting. Um, so I want to I dig much deeper to that. Do you think that, um, you know, if there's more, more protests, that that would allow to lead to more potential compromise? Um, why do you, do you think, do you think of that? Do you think that's possible through that? Why or why not? Um, I would say, uh, yes, more protesting would lead to more compromises, but there is um, kind of like, um, like they, they can't cross the line where it's be too much and they actually, end up, they actually get a, end up getting the, um, the opposite result, like um, more being taken away or they see the protesting as harmful and um, it doesn't really get them anywhere. And so, yes, protesting would um, more compromise, but if it was done in the way. To add on to what my teammate is saying, an example is Black Lives Matter. Um, a lot of, there were a lot of protesters and um, I think, yes, it can come to a compromise if, um, if we, if we, if like the people understand uh, the side and come to uh, agreements. A quick question for the end here, is compromise a good thing or not? Um, compromise is a good thing because 
it would be taking two good things and then mixing it like mixing and matching them together i agree with my team i think uh, so sorry we hit the time thank you so much Amen. let's give them a round of applause here well thank you so much thank you so much for your presentation uh, in the discussion uh, take a deep breath. Take, take a deep breath. Yeah, you can. Uh, you're able. Um, you completed it. Um, congratulations. Um, and so we're going to provide a few comments here and there uh, uh, on your presentation. And so I'll begin. And I just wanted to say thank you so much for a great presentation. I really liked uh, how organized it was, um, especially when you mentioned the three examples of the compromises during the Constitutional Convention. I really liked how you you uh, presented it. And so you had the three, and then you said, here are the pros and cons uh, of each. And so it made it very easy to follow. But I also liked how you were also digging much deeper uh, into the question. And that's why I brought up the protest question, because that's that's incredible. It said, you know, you know, we've, we've had a lot of protests, uh, you know, throughout the history of our country, and even within, you know, even in right now. Um, and, and looking at, you know, you know, what, what leads from those protests to be able to, you know, uh, in order to maybe lead to changes and even compromises that, that could happen in, in the areas where where there's a need. And so I would appreciate, um, you know, that you brought that up and, and, in, and in future uh, research as you continue doing this, continue looking to that. Um, that that's, that's very, that's a very uh, interesting and a very um, insightful thing to, to present. And so I, I commend you, uh, you know, the past uh, two days we've been, uh, we've been together here and I commend you on, on the great work that you've done to your teacher as well. And I wish you the best and continue doing this. This is uh, very important and thank you so much. So I'll give it to my other judges to uh, for their comments. All right, thank you guys for such a great, a great start to our day. Um, I really enjoyed that you brought in so many historical examples of, you know, figures that you thought were principle ridden versus unprincipled. Uh, Jefferson and Hamilton. I would have liked to have heard a little bit more about today. I mean, I think there's there's a lot of discussion about what's going on today around compromise and how there just isn't very much of it. Um, so I would have liked to have heard just a little bit more analysis from you guys on on sort of where our country is now. And that's kind of where I was trying to push you with, with that first question. Uh, the other thing I would encourage you to do is, is think pretty critically about some of these compromises and whether they actually were a good thing. I think a lot of people out there would argue that the three-fifths compromise was not in fact a good compromise. Um, so just something to think about for later. But, uh, but I, I really, really enjoyed our, our conversations over the last couple of days. You guys have done some amazing work. You're clearly dedicated to this. And, and I just, I really appreciate all of the work that you put into it. Let me start out by uh, apologizing again for the uh, for the mess up uh, with my uh, internet connection. Uh, I hope that it did not uh, cause you all any problems. I mean, you got enough pressure on already, and that, and then having me drop off, I uh, I apologize to you. But uh, you, it didn't look like it affected you at, in any way, shape, or form because you gave a very good presentation. I really, you know, you're the first one, so we didn't know. Uh, what we were going to get to the, uh, as response to uh, uh, the question, and I I really enjoyed it. I uh, I particularly liked your, your examples that you gave uh, those uh, three examples, and then threw in the the commerce compromise. And as uh, as Jen said, uh, I liked the uh, uh, the examples of of Jefferson and Hamilton. Um, and my next question was going to be to ask you. Uh, who you would put in those categories among our uh, national leaders today so that uh, we could uh, uh, get your opinion on that. Um, overall, I, I thought you did a, a very good job. Um, and, and again, I, I just want to encourage you um, uh, as it relates to a lot these questions and these issues, uh, uh, it, when you ever have a, a discussion with your classmates or in school or whatever around the, the uh, dining room table with your family. Uh, don't forget what you've learned and that is have a position 
and and uh, understand the other side of that position on an issue, uh, but then uh, state your position with all the facts and the information that you have. Finally, let me let me say to you that um, uh, your teacher and you are an inspiration to us. Um, when we see uh, teachers uh, uh, doing such a good job in providing you with this civics education, and when we see you all as uh, such young people um, having such a bright future, uh, it's, it's just inspiring. Um, continue, continue to be involved and participate. And as we say, we'll have a, a very bright future in your community, in your school, in your community, and in your state. Thank you so much for participating. We wish you the very best of luck and congratulations to you.